I'm delighted to introduce the first technical session of the day, whose focus is MIT's rich history of innovations in computation and how that sets the stage for possible paths forward. During this session, we'll hear from Sherry Turkle, the Abbey Rockefeller Mose Professor of the Social Studies of Science and Technology, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the three com founders professor of engineering, and Patrick Winston, the Ford Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Computer Science. They will share their perspectives on MIT's role in advancing the frontiers of computer science research and education, in scaling access to information and computation globally, and in considering the social impacts of computation. To help set the stage, let me give you five very quick examples of MIT's wonderful history in computing. The pioneers of artificial intelligence included Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, key players in the 1956 Dartmouth Conference that created the field. Both served as MIT faculty, and McCarthy, of course, later moved to Stanford to launch their AI efforts. Public key encryption underlies much of modern secure communication on the internet. It was pioneered in part by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Len Edelman, or RSA, all at MIT at the time. And others, of course, also contributed to this area, including MIT alumnus Whit Diffie. Starting in the 1960s, MIT fostered a wide range of fundamental research in human and computer vision, manipulation, and locomotion. This led, among others, to the creation of iRobot, Boston Dynamics, Mobileye, and SenseTime. In 1983, jointly with DEC and IBM, MIT launched Project Athena. It provided access to computing resources for every student at MIT, and it led to the creation of Kerberos, the X window system, and Zephyr, an early instant messaging system. And in education for all, I've had the privilege of working with John Guttag and Anna Bell to create a MOOC on computational thinking, which has had 1.2 million learners around the world. These are just a few examples of MIT's influence on computation and its impact on the world. And later today, you'll hear examples of current innovations in computation in such diverse areas as biology, medicine, economics, design, or, excuse me, urban planning, finance, and others. So let's get the day started. Good morning. I'm Sherry Turkle. Um, I'm going to be talking about a critique of the idea of the friction free. Uh, most of us, most of us here today, were introduced to the idea of the friction free as a really good thing. Uh, it's an aesthetic of engineering efficiency, so why shouldn't it be a really good thing? But technology is the architect of our intimacies. Technology shapes our ways of thinking about social life, about politics. It shapes our ways of thinking even about ourselves, about the self itself. So this idea that technical things should be smooth and easy blends into and bleeds into other domains. Efficiency becomes aspirational in politics, in business, in education, and in our thinking about relationships. And that's the kind of thing that I study here in my MIT career. In my own research on technology and people, I see hopes for the friction-free pop-up when humans of all ages tell me why they prefer, for example, to text rather than talk, why they would rather send an email to a colleague just in the next cubicle or in the next office, or why they would rather text rather than talk to their spouse than have a face-to-face -face conversation is usually tied up with a hope for greater efficiency and less vulnerability. That's friction-free. 
Now, artificial intelligence, perhaps without meaning to, has become deeply woven into this story. Why? Because artificial intelligence is almost definitionally about the promise of efficiency without vulnerability, or increasingly about the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. But by trying to move ahead toward the friction-free, we are getting ourselves into all kinds of new trouble. But here I get ahead of myself, and let me backtrack just for a moment. The idea of the friction-free has particular meaning for me because I'm a member of a generation that sold it to the world. So I want to begin by talking about my generation. And I'm the Harvard class of 69. Don't boo, don't boo. Um, and we're about to have our 50th college reunion in June. And since the 2016 election, I've been studying how my class, that class of 69, that famous class of 69, thinks about our choices. And I've discovered that as we look back, many of us had the expectation that for us, things should be easy, including our political activism. Now, why did we think that things should be easy? In my interviews, I hear that we were the children of those who had triumphed over fascism, in some case over the threat of extermination. My parents, for example, told me that they had saved the world so that I wouldn't have to. And we were supposed to have an easier life. An easier life. Well, the Vietnam era, that wasn't so easy. But after the war was over, my cohort was quick to declare victory. We inserted ourselves into a narrative of progress, technology, and efficiency. We even had new ideas about making politics efficient. Consultants, we would outsource activism to professionals. This idea of efficiency shaped our worldview and we shaped a world in which when people look for solutions, the first look is often to the efficiencies of technology. Indeed, my generation made our love of the digital technology that came of age with us central to our identity. This new digital world infused with our values had a distinctive aesthetic. And I have said what it is. The difficult will be made easy. The rough will become smooth. That which had friction will become friction free. That digital world we would give to ourselves and we would give to our children. And this new world that the computer augured wouldn't just be friction-free in the sense that economic transactions would go more smoothly, helped by such things as electronic funds transfer. No. This vision was to minimize and even eliminate social friction as well, interactions that might cause emotional stress. In one often cited near future scenario, that is near self-parody, but which is actually partially translated into an actual app that you can put on your phone. You order a beverage on your phone, your mochaccino, cappuccino, whatever you kind of want, and you send it to your favorite coffee shop. And as you walk to pick it up, an app on your phone routes you so that you avoid your ex-spouse <laughs> or anybody you're having an argument with, your department chairman who you're kind of, you know, you're not in a good place with. 
and you only pass your friends. It's like the Marauder's Map in Hogwarts. It's a, you know, it's a Harry Potter thing. And it prevents you from seeing any of these people with whom you might have any, and there's the word friction. But who said that a life without conflict, without dealing with the past or rubbing up against troublesome people makes for the good life? Well, we did. We did. And you can see the fit between my generation's aesthetic of easy and what's possible in the world of apps. But there was also considerable tension because in many cases, life was teaching us one thing and technology was teaching us another. Let me go through some examples. Life taught, for example, that political organizing was hard. The internet made it more convenient but less effective. Face-to-face -face conversation taught that when we stumble and lose our words, it's painful, but we reveal ourselves to each other. Screen life allowed us to edit our thoughts, never be interrupted, and broadcast at will. We practiced we preach, rather, we preached authenticity, but we practiced self-curation. We preached authenticity, but we practiced self-curation. Technology encouraged us to forget what we knew about life, and we made a digital world where we could forget what life was teaching us. My generation infused digital technology with our value of easy, but here is my call to arms after a professional lifetime here at MIT studying this technology. It's time to associate the digital with other values than the value of easy. Let's say the opposite of easy. And it's time to remember that the opposite of easy is not just difficult. The opposite of easy is also evoked by words such as complex, involved, and demanding. That's what digital culture demands of us now. It's time to reclaim our attention, our solitude, our privacy, and our democracy. We have time to make the corrections, not much time, but we have time, and to remember who we are, creatures of history, of deep psychology, of complex relationships that intrinsically generate friction as they are worked out. Why is that? Friction means being authentic, Friction means being vulnerable, putting yourself in the place of another person with all of the conflict that can bring, including inner conflict that needs to be faced. How should we take these insights into our thinking about the new college? First, consider the idea of intended consequences. For years, I've written about technology's unintended consequences, and that narrative no longer fits the known facts. We now introduce technology with consequences that we can see straight off, with consequences that are intended. We knowingly put in place technology that will spy on us, use our lives as data, for the purposes and the profit of corporations, political parties, governments, anyone really that can profit from what we say, see, or watch online. Computer counselors, this is a subject very close to my heart, computer counselors in the role of psychotherapists are put in place to simulate the feeling of human understanding where there is none. Technology is becoming an intentional participant in what I call an assault on empathy. Making this step from seeing technology's effects as unintended to intended wakes us up to our responsibility as citizens, as consumers, 
and frankly, as humans. Second, get responsible about social media. Around 10 years ago, when Facebook was just coming into high schools, I began interviewing students about their attitudes about privacy. One young woman, an early Facebook enthusiast, told me she wasn't much concerned. And she said to me, who would care about me and my little life? And it was a good question. And here's the answer. In the current corporate regime, when we go online, our little lives are bought and sold in bits and pieces to the highest bidder and for any purpose. When I wrote about that interview in Alone Together in 2012, I asked whether we could have intimacy without privacy and whether we could have democracy without privacy. And I argued that no, we could not. But here's the thing. When I considered those questions, I thought about those two problems separately. I thought about those two problems separately. I had a lot to learn. The social media business model evolved to sell our privacy in ways that have fractured our democracy. All of this unfolded in plain sight. But here's what I've learned in my studies. Even after we could see it unfolding in plain sight, we didn't want to see it. We had a love affair with technology that seemed magical. And like all magic, it worked by commanding our attention so that we took our eyes off what was actually going on. But here we are today in a new place and with a mandate to pay attention. We can no longer say, who will care about us and our little lives? Now the question is, how much do we care? We have to face not only the question, how does technology impact society, but another question, more difficult to deal with, but always adjacent to it. How does society impact technology? Because technology is animated by money and power, by social values and social blindness. Once you look for it, you see society and technology everywhere. If a program to decide who gets a mortgage sees mostly white faces, because mostly white faces have received mortgages in the past, the program will be more likely to say that white faces should get mortgages. Society in technology. If more white people get bail, a program trained in that culture will suggest bail for white people. Society in technology. These examples have become well known, but they are good to think with because they illustrate why AI scientists need to be trained in a new, digitally sophisticated sociology of knowledge because social relations will always become embodied in code. So we have to live in our technological world, but remember what we know about life and the life we want to live. We have to work on the real world as hard as we work on our technology. We can't just work on our technology and hope it fixes the real world. That's how I see the mandate of this new institution. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for setting up uh, the, uh, for defining the context. As we go, as we go, it's an exciting time. Uh, it's a positive time, a time of hope, and 
uh, for, to be starting a new college, but anywhere where you talk about technology, you talk about computing out there, not just to, to experts like you've seen, uh, but to people on the street in general, when you ask them about the web, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, about technology in general, people are very concerned, people are very skeptical. We're, uh, there is uh, much more of a concern balancing uh, all the utopia which we, which we started off with 30 years ago than there has ever been before, and for, good, for very good reasons. And some of the, a lot of those have been outlined. Let me say that, um, that for me, that looking back, it was 30 years. I, we say that the birth of the web was when I wrote the first memo, and that was March 12th. 1989, when in 1989 I was looking back at 20 years of internet development, s sitting there in CERN and Geneva, uh, and decided that we needed to have a global information space, it would be really cool, I needed it, it should be a collaborative medium, and uh, I looked at the internet technology which was available, and I looked at the capacity of computers and programming languages and computer protocols and so on, and put together the World Wide Web. But back then, uh, if you, those of you who have, have enough gray hairs to, to remember what it was like, you know, then there was, uh, there was a sort of uh, a fashion for cyber utopia. John Perry Barlow had written a manifesto for cyberspace that basically said, guys, we won't need all your organizational structures. We won't need your nations, because when we connect using, uh, in the cyber world, then we will connect just as individuals, as peers, and we will organize. There will be peace and love, and we will organize ourselves without all this stuff which comes from nations and laws. And uh, because on the web, on the internet, there, was, uh, there are no nations. And, there's, and, and in fact, it's true. It was, you know, when, the, when I started off, I sat down and plugged my computer into the internet in CERN and Geneva, and uh, the, nobody coming to the very first web server that I built with the, very f with the installations of the very first web, brow web browsers had any idea that, that I was in, uh, in Switzerland. And when they made a blog and stored it somewhere in the web, they had no idea, and they didn't care about the international board. So, so you would have been forgiven for imagining that we could go down a path where we end up producing very much stronger social structures, very much stronger democracies. Uh, democracies and things like we looked, at, we looked at the blogosphere, and initially, when people blogged on the internet, there was something very, very positive about it, that they felt that they were both choosing their words so as to get more and more readers, and they were choosing the things they linked to, to only link to the other blogs, which were, uh, which were as good as they could be. And they found that with, with, in the, with the other bloggers that they discovered and they linked to and who linked to them, there was this feeling that, wow, we are building, we're actually, this is great, because I'm just writing about my particular, the, the, the bird that I like, and all the other bird fanciers are writing about the birds that they're, together we more or less have the best online, have a better online resource about all these different birds than we've, we've ever had, has ever been published in a book. And things like Wikipedia, which, has, which now is, is one of the marvels of the web. Uh, if you like, a brilliant example of where people work together to tweak the way the processes work, to tweak the way that you can complain about things, the way, way arguments are handled, and the way eventually the community as a whole works towards some idea of positive absolute truth out there on, the, uh, uh, on the, in Wikipedia. That's being a great example for the positive. However, now, and, and, and in fact, for the first 20 years of that, 30 years of the web, if you'd talked to me about it, and uh, you'd have come to me and said, Tim, uh, you invented this web thing, and I found some junk on it. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of bad stuff on it. I would say to you, as a user, you shouldn't, you just don't go there, okay? Don't click on that again. If you click on it, the, the links in that page once, then take it out of your bookmarks. N nurture your bookmarks to point to good things. And people did it, and we all, and we all did. And we all ended up with brilliant uh, uh, experience of the, uh, 
uh, life on the web, but using, uh, but use it in, in a way using a technique which just, in fact, wraps us into what we now know as a filter bubble. Wraps us into a group of people who ended up com living in a world uh, in which they all mutually agree uh, about a lot of things, but where we uh, and where we don't worry about the fact that there is another group of people, large number of people, groups who have not ended up in, in, in cycles and vicious cycles where they end up producing, virtuous circles where they end up producing truth, but have ended up in vicious cycles where they've ended up producing untruth and nastiness. And so the web has, been, so we've had to, we need to do a mid-course correction. I've been calling for many years, more than a decade, for, uh, for web science, in the sense of a science like just we have cognitive science to look at the brain, we need web science to look at the um, uh, look at this process. The uh, the process uh, of web science involves looking at the way people interact on the web and the way organisations interact on the web. So it's a very multidisciplinary multi thing. So I've been calling for that for a long time. One of the great things about a college for computing is, well, we should, that it should be uh, very multidisciplinary. It should, yes, computing, a huge amount of energy has to go into computing, but it has to be strictly in a way that all the other fields, some of which are new fields completely, uh, but certainly all the ones we know we have to involve, like um, uh, economics. You can't uh, understand how the web works without understanding economics. You can't understand how the web works without understanding psychology. You can't understand how the web works uh, without having people understand how, how microscopic systems lead to macroscopic phenomena. So you need physicists, you need people, maybe you, know, cli you need climate scientists, because we have a, there is a climate change which we have spent a long time looking at, but on, now we have a social climate change. And the social climate has changed very much for the worse. Just as the climate in the world has got hotter, the social climate, you can not, a lot of people feel, has got nasty. So building, we need to use this College of Computing as a very powerful tool uh, to bring all of the, um, all of the fields around, uh, surround computing together with computing in order to do a reset. I've, some of you may have heard, yes, I, uh, I've had a project at, at MIT called Solid, uh, so solid.mit.edu, which I found as exciting as one part of a sort of reboot to the web. It's a project to use web technology, but in a way where we reorganize things, we separate the apps from the data. We say that everybody should be in complete control of their own data. Uh, and we... Uh, so that you get what we call a solid pod. You, get, you have one or two pods, some for home, some for work. They may be out there in a piece of cloud that you own, but whichever pod it is, or you may be running it on a computer at home, if you're on the geeky side, but wherever you store your data, the solid rule is you have complete control over who and what gets access to it for what. And so the solid attitude is, using, uh, is to use web technologies but in a way in which we, we flip a world uh, uh, around. We, if you like, we, uh, we, people have said, but you're turning the whole privacy question upside down. I think uh, it's more a question of turning it right side up. We're, we're building a world in which individuals own their own data initially, and if anybody else wants to use them, they have to come, you, you have to come to me. It's an exciting world of, in which apps, uh, in which uh, if I build an app, uh, it will just be, so I can build it right on a neat program today and go to sleep and tomorrow find out that people are using it all over the world without uh, me having to build a back end because they're using it with their existing stores. Uh, it's ex so for me, that's exciting. It's an example, having that project in MIT, it was great to have uh, colleagues, space, uh, and... Uh, uh, and excitement and energy and, and review at MIT in CSAIL. Uh, I hope that the college will, uh, will do many things. Also, we have a startup now, and one of the things I think is great to be at MIT is that MIT is famous for being, making it, uh, respecting 
and making it as uh, easy and straightforward as possible for you to be able to spin these things out into companies when you feel that we, you need to have a commercial uh, energy behind these things. So the startup is Inrupt. Uh, thanks to Gaswing for uh, funding it, even though it looks as, uh, like a really interesting, different sort of uh, project. Uh, and and d d folks, do, do go to uh, interrupt.com or solid.interrupt.com. The hope is that with Solid, this arc of the web, which initially I thought started off as being a, a sort of potentially utopian thing, now seems to be coming over and potentially he heading towards a very dystopian future for democracy, for education, uh, uh, and uh, uh, sewing, and where all of the, these things in the utopian days that we hoped we were to do maybe uh, be the severely threatened or already largely destroyed mid course correction. So, with projects like Solid, re decentralizing the web, turning back into a place where individual people. Are, uh, have a mandate, individual people have power, then we're hoping that the, direct, the, the trajectory over the next 10, 20 years will be towards massive individual empowerment, massive ability of groups to be able to collaborate and solve huge, the huge problems in the space. And if you like, uh, if uh, John Perry Barlow uh, rolls over in his grave at the current situation, maybe he will be, uh, his spirit will be happier with us in the future as we build more and more in, uh, really positive, creative, collaborative, democratic systems on top of this uh, new version of the web. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. I've been looking forward to it for 50 years. <laughs> when I uh, started thinking about what to say today, it occurred to me that I have been around for a while, and maybe um, it would be uh, my best contribution if I talked a little bit about where we are and where we've come from and where we might go and how we might get there. Um, in the beginning, I thought, well, I will give a comprehensive uh, overview of everything, but um, I decided in the end to point out that where we are is here at a historic moment, not only for MIT, but for the world. Because computing is no longer just for practicing professionals, it's for everybody. It's an important thing to know about, just like literature and history and a little bit of mathematics and perhaps anthropology. So that's where we are, but where we came from, that's impossible. I started thinking about this, and a friend loaned me a chart from the 25th anniversary of Project Mac. And I thought, well, let's see. Uh, I'll just cover those milestones. There were about 300. <laughs> and extrapolating to today, I think uh, I would have to talk about 1,000 things, which would give me a little less than one second each. So I soon gave up on that and decided I would give you a personal history of computing at MIT and talk a little bit about and focus on the greatest computing innovation of all time. That's my agenda. So to start, well, I started on my first, very first day at MIT. As a freshman, I found myself wandering around in Building 26 looking for the lecture hall in which I would learn physics. I found myself looking in this door, looking in this window. It was the IBM 7090 computer. And boy, was I impressed. It was inspiring. This was the day when computers had gravitas. <laughs> they, had, uh, they had blinking lights and tape drives spun. <laughs> it was wonderful. But the amazing thing is that so many wonderful things were done with that computer. The first, the first great II program was done on that computer, a program that did symbolic integration, the same way I was learning to do integration in my calculus class. And that computer, that computer had 
this cell phone is 50 to 100,000 times faster than that computer. And this computer has about 250,000 times as much memory. So it's amazing that anything got done on that. But in any case, it was still inspiring. <laughs> well, a few years later, I think I was uh, a senior. I witnessed a debate between Seymour Papert and Hubert Dreyfus in a class taught by Jerry Letvin. Letvin was a character. He announced on the first day that there would be no quizzes and no homework. Everyone would get a B unless they did a term paper, in which case they would get either an A or a C. <laughs> well, then came the debate. Uh, Dreyfus, a philosopher, uh, argued that uh, computers could never be intelligent. And he talked about how it would be impossible for a computer program to play chess at a championship level. And he talked about fringe consciousness and used a lot of big words. And being young and impressionable, at the end of his talk, I thought, well, who will have the courage to debate against this wisdom? But then it wasn't a face-to-face -face debate. Uh, Papper came in a few classes later. And in the meantime, they had somehow arranged to have a match between Dreyfus and a chess playing program written by Richard Greenblatt. And, and this game enabled Papert to start his talk by saying, Dreyfus has said that computers can't play chess. And if that's true, then Dreyfus can't play chess either. <laughs> but in any event, I started hearing about the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and it seemed like a place where fun was going to flourish. It attracted people from the Tech Model Railroad Club, people like Richard Greenblatt and Tom Knight, who found the computers were even more fun uh, than model railroads. So I was, uh, I, I, said, I suppose I was ripe when a friend of mine um, suggested that um, I might go to see a lecture by Marvin Minsky, and I did. I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, uh, had found myself in graduate school, and I didn't know why. My father had started talking darkly about law school. <laughs> but I went to this lecture by Minsky, and, 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 and there was such joy in his, in his uh, talk, and such uh, pride in what his students had done, and such uh, passion for what uh, would be done in the future. Uh, I left the lecture saying to my friend, I want to do what he does. And pretty soon, I was doing what he did, and pretty soon after that, he was talking about what I did. You might uh, give it a fourth example, this, and say, that is an arch. And the description of this structure uh, uh, agrees with the description that's been building up, except for one small detail. The top thing is no longer a block, it's a wedge, and the program has to say, I'll accept things that are wedges as well as blocks, and that's pretty easily changed by saying this can be block or wedge, or in the actual program it generalizes and says that can be a prison. Well, the point of the program is that uh, it doesn't learn so much a little bit at a time as in the traditional reinforcement theories of learnings, which work very well for rats and very badly for people, but for each example, the machine jumps to some sort of conclusion, learns a new relation, and uh, it can learn very fast. It's learned a lot from poor examples. On the other hand, it takes a good teacher. If you gave it uh, misleading examples where there are many differences between the things it's seen and the new things, then it will uh, be at sea. There will be a lot of differences that it could put in here, and it won't have any good way of deciding which differences to represent in its final result. So it's good to know, uh, even back then, we were thinking about a different kind of AI than the kind that's popular today. Today, what we have is statistical and perceptual, and that's complemented by the things that were happening back then and should happen in the future, the cognitive and the thinking part of AI. In any event, I finished my degree, and uh, a year or two later found myself director of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. There's controversy about how that came to be. Some say uh, I had arranged a coup d'etat. Others say I was tricked into it. But in any case, uh, Seymour Papert said, don't worry, 
you'll only have to do it for a year or two. And it turned out to be 25. Dan, wherever you are, take care. This could happen again. <laughs> so a um, short time later, uh, really rather at the beginning, I knew I was young and stupid and didn't know anything about running a laboratory. So I went around MIT asking department heads and laboratory directors how I could make the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory a great laboratory. And uh, to my surprise, in my first dozen efforts, no one had any ideas. They, ha they hadn't thought about the question. So then I thought, in desperation, I would go to see Jay Forrester. Now, Forrester had built the uh, whirlwind computer in the late 40s and early 50s. And it was to be a prototype for the computer that ended up in the SAGE air, um, air defense system. And that was a really magnificent computer. It was, the, the relay racks there were 11 feet tall. Uh, they employed hundreds of people to build it. It was the first computer with magnetic core memory. It was the fastest computer. And when I went to see Forrester, it was frightening. There was a table with a white tablecloth. There was uh, set for tea and cookies. Forrester was in an immaculate suit and well-chosen tie. I wasn't. <laughs> and uh, for the first uh, 25 minutes of our 30-minute interview, he told me why we should not have an artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT. I never did understand why. But finally, in desperation, I said, well, Professor Forrester, it must have been a great laboratory because of the excitement associated with building that wonderful computer. And he looked at me like I was the king of the fools and said, young man, we weren't trying to build a computer. We were trying to protect the United States against air attack from the Soviet Union. And that had a big effect on me, because what it told me is, you don't become best by wanting to be best. You become best by having a big mission, and then being best will take care of itself. So uh, there we are. Uh, we have um, inspiration, courage, joy, and mission. And so it's natural to think, well, what should be the mission of the new college? And to me, the mission ought to be to take everything at MIT to another level, not just computing, but everything. And that ought to be in the service of an even bigger mission, which, as President Reif said in his inaugural address, what MIT is about is solving the unsolvable, shaping the future, and serving the nation and the world. But it isn't all serious, as a, even Forrester pointed out. Listen to this one. And uh, before uh, leaving, uh, we would like to uh, show you another kind of mathematical problem that uh, some of the boys have worked out in uh, their spare time in a less uh, serious vein for Sunday afternoon. Yeah, so they had fun too, but you know, did you see those words? The things that they worked out on a Sunday afternoon on their spare time. They were spending a lot of money, and they didn't want the taxpayers to think that they were doing just frivolous things. So uh, what's left? Uh, there is something that's left, and it has to do with curiosity. And by curiosity, I don't mean just ordinary curiosity. I mean the kind that leads to great things, that sort of out-of-control curiosity that led uh, Copernicus to figuring out where we are in the universe, and Darwin to figuring out where we are in evolution, and um, Franklin, Watson, and Crick uh, figuring out the nature of our biology. And when you say, well, what could possibly be next? That brings me back to the greatest computing innovation of all time. And what's that? It's us. We are the greatest computing innovation of all time, because nothing else can think like we think. Chimpanzees can't do it. Neanderthals can't do it. And we don't know how to make computers do it yet. But it's something we should aspire to. And it's something that we've been aspiring to for a long time. The Greeks started thinking about thinking. Alan Turing started thinking about whether computers could think. And Marvin Minsky showed us how to do it. But in going forward, I think we have to go backward, too, and not just a little bit, about 75,000 years. That's when we started thinking. And this is what Ian Tattersall had to say about it. 
So what do you mean by recombining? Well, as Berwick and Chomsky have noted in their seminal book, Why Only Us, it's all about the ability to put symbols together to build symbolic descriptions. And once you have that operation, which they call merge, then you get to what I call the strong story hypothesis. Yes, this is a strong story hypothesis that says what we, the way we differ uh, from other species is in the stories that we tell. And we start with our stories in childhood. They persist through high school. And eventually, we come to study stories in areas like these, which happen, of course, to be the five schools at MIT. <laughs> so some say that if we uh, do all that, we will be um, partaking of another forbidden fruit, and that um, this knowledge will become an existential threat. I'm more optimistic. I, I'm, I am optimistic, because to me, unless we get hit by an asteroid, our biggest existential threat is actually us. So I, I take a more optimistic view and think that, in the end, there's no reason why computers can't think like we and can't be ethical and moral like we aspire to be. Some say ethical and moral as we are. How could it be possible for a computer to do that? Well, every time I watch the evening news, I think to myself, it can't be that hard. <laughs> so I don't know what others may do, but as for me, what I hope to do with my friends and colleagues and like-minded people is go forward into the future with these kinds of ideas painted on our wall. A desire to put all of those things together to develop a greater understanding of ourselves and how we think and how other people think. And that can't help but be a good thing. And that's the end of my story for today, but I hope it will be just the beginning of a story that will be told in the days and years to come.